think. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning and welcome, and welcome to, the, to, the, to, the to the second day, second of, day the of the Spring Seminar. seminar. Um, um, we, are we are now starting, starting to, to have, have uh, the, second the second keynote, keynote speaker, speaker, which is which Jose, Jose Bertu. Bertu. Thank, you, thank you, Jose, Jose for, for accepting, accepting our, our invitation. invitation. Jose, Jose is a PhD, is a PhD in, in Comparative, comparative studies, studies by the University of Lisbon. Of Lisbon. Um, um, with a joint, with a joint uh, uh, degree, degree with, with the, the Catholic, Catholic University, University of Lovaina and, and the Bologna, Bologna University. University. Um, um, he has, he has made, made a project, a project about, about death, death and spectrality in Portuguese cinema. That's also why we invited him. And this, this is already published, published in this book. 
and Jose has published many books in last year. In the last years, uh, one of them I also brought with me, and it is an edit editing um, with Fernando Guerreiro, Guerreiro, which is Mort, uh, Death and Spectrality in Arts and Literature. Both books are in Portuguese. Um, so, also, uh, José has also some uh, experience in uh, teaching and is a researcher of the Center for Comparative Studies of the Letters Faculty at the University of Lisbon. So, I will pass now to you. Thank you, José. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here this early in the morning. I would also like to especially thank uh, um, the organizers of this um, seminar, especially um, Danielle Ribas and um, Nun Christ for inviting me. It is, uh, it is a, a great honor to be here. And uh, as you, some of you know, um, and uh, Danielle also pointed that out, um, some, most of the work I have been doing uh, in the last few years um, revolves around this topic of spectralities. It is something that um, obsesses me, that interests me very, very much. So it's really a pleasure being here um, with you in such a beautiful uh, city uh, like Porto. Um, okay, so uh, for, the, for this presentation, um, I tried to benefit from the fact that I am kick-starting it. There was a, a talk yesterday uh, but it was an artist talk, so I'm the first researcher uh, presenting his work. So I try to do something um, very broad and um, uh, raise uh, several questions that I think other researchers will pick up in later uh, presentations, later today and tomorrow. So this was my, um, my aim with this presentation. Um, we are a little behind, so I will start uh, now. Um, oh, yes, but I, I wanted to uh, show you this um, movie first. I w okay. I wasn't going to tell you the title, but it was already on the screen, so you already know what it is. It is a film by Georges Méliès, Le Manoir du Diable, from 1896.
Thank you, thank you. In a medieval, in a medieval castle, a man introduces a woman to a knight. When the knight kneels down to kiss the maiden's hand, she transforms into a horrible witch. In fact, the spectator already knew this, the man who introduced the woman and the knight is a demonic creature, and the woman is a specter conjured up by him. This is one of the various apparitions the knight is forced to deal with in this three-minute film. The House of the Devil, described as the first horror film ever, was filmed in 1896. It is one of the first films by Georges Méliès and, consequently, one of the first films in the history of cinema. It is also the inaugural example from a series of films directed by Méliès in which supernatural entities make special appearances. Throughout the period corresponding to the cinema of attractions, as Tom Gunning described it, Méliès and his successors made several films within a proto-fantastic genre. These are films invariably packed with magical creatures and extraordinary events. By the end of the 1900s, filmmakers such as D.W. Griffith or Louis Fayad directed a series of successful films that contributed to the establishment of narrativity as the primary mode of filmmaking and consequently, film production went through significant changes. Discussing the transition between the cinema of attractions and narrative cinema, pioneer film theorist Ugo Munsterberg states that narrative film requires more sophisticated processes, both in terms of production and reception. According to Munsterberg's vision of the evolution of cinematographic language, around 1905, filmmakers ceased aiming mainly at the creation of a sense of wonder in spectators and started to aim at capturing the audience's attention continuously for a longer period of time. Films became longer, less focused on visual tricks, and more focused on plot development. Today, the transition between these two models is hardly considered a definite break. Segundo de Chamon, the most famous of Méliès's followers, directed Legend of a Ghost in 1908, a then considered long film, with 14 minutes, that presents us with several apparitions and magical disappearances. However, even if this film is already sparsely narrative, it still belongs largely to the cinema of attractions, as narrative here seems mostly an excuse to show numerous magic tricks. From the next decade onwards, supernatural creatures started integrating cinematographic narratives in seemingly more organic and complex ways. For example, Russian filmmaker Yevgeny Bauer directed Day Dreams and After Death, both in 1915, fiction films in which the ghosts of, the, of dead women returned to the world of the living to haunt the man they had loved while they were alive. In films like these, these the ghost is not only a figure that stands out as a perfect way to showcase the technical wonders of film, as had happened in the early films of Méliès and Chomon. On the contrary, from the 1910s on, 1910s on, the ghost figure allowed for more sophisticated stories and artistic creations. At the same time, the fantastic started to grow within cinematographic discourse, especially in German Expressionism and its vast gallery of non-human creatures. The automata in the cabinet of Dr. Dr. Caligari, the golem in Der Golem, the vampire in Nosferatu, or the doppelganger, that is, the double, in the student, the student of Prague in both the 1913 and the 1926 versions. These creatures, continue a tradition that harks back to the 18th century, particularly in literature, not only in Germany, but also in the United States, France, or even Portugal, with authors that made use of, supernatural, of the supernatural to question reality, truth, and the limits of human knowledge. Writers such as Friedrich Schiller, Edgar Allan Poe, Théophile Gautier, Henry James, or Alvaro de Carvalhal 
Albert Carvalhal, <laughs> sorry. In sum, if literature was the site of the modern fantastic, particularly in the 19th century, in the 20th century, filmmakers quickly realized that cinema, an ostentatiously visual medium, is, in fact, the perfect place to explore this genre. The more ubiquitous among these creatures is, however, the ghost, which runs across the whole history of cinema like none of those other non-human beings. And interestingly, the ghost became a prominent figure not only in the fantastic or in horror cinema, as it would be expected, but also in other genres such as comedy, war film, or melodrama. To evoke some examples, and they are plenty and very diverse, so this is just a small group of films uh, selected by elective affinities, we can think of the French tradition of quality with Sylvie and the Phantom by Claude Autant Lara, the classical American film with Gothic undertones from the 40s and 50s with The Portrait of Jenny by William Dittel, Japanese New Wave with Empire of Passion by Nagisa Oshima, mainstream cinema from the 80s and 90s with Truly Madly Deeply by Anthony Mingala, or many contemporary filmmakers such as João Pedro Rodrigues, Two Drifters, Christian Petzold, Diella, which is a kind of reimagination of Herc Harvey's 1962 classic Carnival of Souls, another ghost film, or film with ghosts. A Pichatong Verazeta Kul, Uncle Bunmi, who can recall his past lives, or more recently, oh, I'm sorry, A Pichatong Verazeta Kul, or more recently, Mati Diop with her Atlantique, among many, many others. In all the films I have mentioned, the ghost is a prominent, explicit, and visible narrative figure. However, as we will see next, the so-called spectrality of cinema does not need the depiction of ghosts to be taken into consideration and reflected upon. Because, to put it briefly, cinema is always a ghostly medium, whether it features actual ghosts or not. In its April issue of 2001, Cahiers du Cinéma published an interview with Jacques Derrida conducted by Antoine de Bec and Thierry Jousse titled Le Cinéma et ses Fantômes, that is, Cinema and its Ghosts. The ghosts to which this title points to, however, are not the ghosts that had inhabited films since the early attractions conceived by Georges Méliès at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. They are, above all, the ghosts that haunt cinema as a medium and, consequently, ourselves as spectators, the ghosts of cinema. In the same interview, Derrida discusses the difference I am alluding to between ghosts in cinema and ghosts of cinema in the following terms. Cinema can stage phantomality almost head-on, to be sure, as in the tradition of fantasy film, vampire or ghost films, certain works of Hitchcock, this must be distinguished from the thoroughly spectral structure of the cinematic image. In this passage, Derrida highlights the same idea I hypothesized, that whether dealing with the figure of the ghost or not, cinema is an essentially spectral medium at its core. In his 1956 book, The Cinema or the Imaginary Man, Edgar Morin advances a similar hypothesis to Derrida's. Discussing the emergence with Méliès of the fantastic in the history of cinema, the French author writes that the ghost is not a simple efflorescence, it plays a genetic and structural role. More recently, in an article that traces the spectral genealogy of cinema, Alan Kolodenko refers to the ghost as the Ur figure of the seventh art. At the beginning of his article, the scholar writes, it is the key premise of this essay that not only is the specter a privileged subject of film, but that it would be the Ur figure of cinema if cinema could have an Ur figure, if the specter could be an Ur figure, a figure not only operating at every second, at every level, in every aspect of every film, but also at the level of the cinematic, or rather animatic, apparatus of film, hence at the level of film as such. From its early stages to our 21st century, cinema has been theoretically considered an inherently spectral medium. But what do we really mean when we describe cinema as a spectral medium, or art form? First things first. What André Bazin called 
the ontology of the photographic image. Having a photographic basis, film is a realm where the dead may find a way to remain, so to speak, within the world of the living. Or, as Mary Leder put it, the photographic ontology of film transforms cinema, deliberately or accidentally, into, I quote, a storehouse for our dead. Identifying photography as the forerunner of cinema within a spectral framework makes it necessary to look into it more closely, paying special attention to the way it relates to life and death. And that is what I will do in the next few minutes, minutes changing my attention from cinema to photography. In the first decades of the 19th century, photography became the perfect medium to depict the human figure. And for this reason, the portrait quickly turned into one of the most celebrated and practiced genres by professional photographers. Producing the seemingly perfect copy of the forms and shapes we see in the visible world, photography presents itself as the most accurate image of the world and its living inhabitants, a perfect duplication of reality. However, since photography's early years, these images are not only perceived in their iconic dimension, that is, they are not only an image of the world, but they also hold other mysterious meanings more difficult to pinpoint. One of these, and the one that interests me here today, is related to the special proximity between photography and life. This proximity produced tensions that are still unclear to us today in the 21st century, but which were even more striking in the 19th. Particularly, it is interesting to observe that, in the 19th century, some views on photography conceived it, conceived it as a technique that extracts the life out of living beings. Commenting on this social, but also theoretical and philosophical phenomenon, French critic Maxime Scheinfeigel writes that, in the 19th century, some suspected that photography was a diabolical technique which was able to steal people's souls to capture their aura. In fact, if we look into a uh, prominent photographer Felix Nadar's book, When I Was a Phot Photographer, a collection of writings on, the, on the, the new medium, and specifically into a chapter titled Balzac and the Daguerreotype, we are told that Honoré de Balzac, for whom each body in nature was composed of a series of specters in infinitely superimposed layers, foliated into infinitesimal pellicles, believed that every Daguerrean operation would catch, detach, and retain, by fixing onto itself, one of the layers of the photographed body. This means that, for Balzac, as for many of his contemporaries, the event of being photographed resulted in an inevitable ontological fragmentation or even dissolution. We could say, in short, that in the 19th century, many people believed that photography would slowly turn them into some kind of ghost. For this reason, photography quickly becomes a channel that connects, in puzzling ways, life and death. At the same time that it subtracts life from the human beings whose image it captures, photography gives them the possibility to remain in the world as an image, a perfect mimetic copy, much beyond their own physical death. In La Chambre Claire, Roland Barthes, who wrote this book after the death of his mother, famously summarizes this faculty when he writes that photography enables, quote, the return of the dead. In the end, photography may be considered a spectral medium because it offers the possibility of giving humans, but also flowers, animals, objects, etc., a posthumous life. As Susan Sontag famously proposed, all photographs are memento mori. This happens because the ontology of the photographic image is based on two main paradoxes. The first paradox is spatial. For example, the loved one that I see in a picture that I keep in my wallet is in fact absent. The second paradox is temporal. The photo of my loved one was taken in the present, as all photos are. It froze that present time in the form of an image, which means that when I look into the photo today, I see a moment in time that was forever lost and yet is here with me, even if in a two-dimensional dimensional rectangle. These are some of the reasons why we can state that photography is, maybe, is the, the ultimate art of thresholds. 
Spirit photography is the most prominent symbol of this liminality, and William H. Mumler was its inventor when he discovered the possibility of superimposing two or more exposures in order to create a single image. That is, at the heart of spirit photography, there is a very basic technique that is quite familiar to us today, but which at the time was revolutionary, double or multiple exposure. After Mumler, several photographers benefited from his discovery to open businesses related to the fabrication of spirits. Many people were willing to pay for the opportunity of being imprinted on a photograph in the company of their dead relatives. In the introduction to a special journal issue on photography cinema and the ghostly co-edited with me, Margarida Medeiros, who wrote extensively on the topic of spirit photography, explains that this success of spirit photography in the 19th century is related to the documental and the apodictic qualities of photography, which transformed this new medium into visual proof. She writes, it is important to emphasize that the productive relationship of the photograph with the spirits resides in the fact that it is the apodictic nature of the former, its documental value, that guarantees the reality of the represented. The well-known photographers that made spirit and fluid images insisted on highlighting their non-aesthetic ca character, seeing them simply as proof, that is, referring them to a fundamental characteristic of photography, indexicality. This odd cultural practice, which was essentially a big hoax, is in itself an evidence that photography was viewed as a unifying medium between different realms of existence, life and death, brought together in a single image, a material document. And the ghost in the photo, a superimposition that exists at the limit of visibility, is the very emblem of this perceived relation. And now, coming back to cinema. In its initial phase, that is, with the short films of the Lumière brothers, cinema does not seem to add to photography much more than movement. The objects and living beings are still immortalized on the reel, but now they can be seen as, as if moving. In a way, cinema emerges as a new technological devel development of photography, animated photographs, as Maxim Gorky called it. For the way, it exponentiates a set of characteristics already present in photography and which I have summarily described. However, while photography has a clear dimension as a pseudo-presence, as Susan Sontag put it, cinema, through time and movement, creates an even more uncanny and radically new kind of presence. It is as if it created an original mechanism of representation that enables the formation of a reality of its own. We can suspect this is why the first spectators were reportedly terrified with the arrival of the train at La Ciotat on the screen, as if this medium were too real not to be real. Since, as Tom Gunning explained, photography and also cinema as an extension is an uncanny phenomenon, one which seems to undermine the unique identities of objects, creating a parallel world of phantasmatic doubles alongside the concrete world of senses, as verified by positivism. Morin also writes that cinema is, like photography, I quote, the world of doubles, of the dead. But some attributes of cinema also distance it from photography. It is a well-known fact that, until the advent of the no less spectral digital format, the moving image that we see on the screen is achieved by the artificial connection between a series of still images, 24 per second, imprinted on the film, that is, the material uh, pellicle. Such connection creates the illusion of movement, which happens only during the projection. Consequently, while the materiality of the photograph is precise, it is here, I can hold it in my hands, cinema only exists as an event while the film is being projected. In this event, as I called it, a kind of happening, the appearance and disappearance of the still images create the impression of movement on a surface which is, in fact, physically untouched, in contrast with what happens in traditional photography or in painting where the images have a self-sufficient materiality. In fact, this leads us to consider that the true material of the cinematographic image is light, which, by the way, is a remarkably spectral material. 
As a necessary element for the machine to project the shapes and colors onto the screen, light not only enables us to see the film, as it enables the film to exist as such, that is, as moving pictures, and not only as a series of still dead images. From another perspective on the spectral qualities of cinema, we should also note that the situation of watching a film is also related to spectrality. In his interview, Derrida associates the film experience to the unconscious, while at the same time he considers the unconscious the legitimate site of the ghost. He says, the cinematic experience belongs thoroughly to spectrality, which I link to all that has been said about the spectre in psychoanalysis. Associating spectatorship with perception, projection, and spectacle, the French philosopher develops this analogy, stating that in a séance, that is, when watching a film in the theater, every viewer is in communication with some work of the unconscious. This séance happens in the dark room, where projected light creates within phenomenal reality, the theater, a slightly, a slightly alternate, but also complementary, reality made of light and shadows. Here, Derrida uses the term séance in its double sense. In French, this term can refer both to a film session and a session of spiritism. The idea is that to watch a film in the theater is analogous to being visited by ghosts, since, as Véronique Campin puts it, I quote, through the projected image, a spectral dimension of reality always comes into place. As the Portuguese film scholar Fernando Guerreiro notes, the analogy between film projection and spectatorship and Plato's cave has a long tradition in the history of film theory that considers this medium in its spectral dimension. Guerreiro suggests that, like Plato's cave, cinema produces and projects specters, simulacra of real objects, or shadows, uncertain or hybrid objects between being and non-being. From the point of view of its workings and its effects, cinema deals with the spheres of the imaginary and the oniric, which enable us spectators to access new possibilities for reality and life. As a consequence, we can say that going to the movies is to look for the company of specters, in a way. It is like being haunted, psychologically for sure, but physically as well, since our bodies are also covered with the interplay between light and shadows on the screen. And when cinema haunts us through its lights and shadows, it also turns us into a kind of cinematic material, as Edgar Morin was arguing already in the 50s. Discussing the double haunting effect of cinema, that is, the film haunting the spectator and the spectator haunting the film, Morin synthesizes some of the ideas I have been exploring here today. He writes the following. This world, the world of cinema, needs our substance in order to live. At the moment of participation, all the film's characters are externally determined, but internally free. They have two dimensions, but internally three. Externally, they are ghosts. Internally, they live. That is, they are also externally in three dimensions, dimensions, externally corporeal, externally free. And now comes the most important part of this passage. They live a life that is drawn from us. So they are like vampires, the, the characters on the screen. That, that is what he's saying. They have taken our souls and our bodies, have adjusted them to their size and their passions. It is rather we who, in the dark theater, are their ghosts, their audience of ectoplasms. Provisionally dead, we watch the living. My wish thus far was to point to some of the reasons why the concept of the ghost works as a particularly adequate metaphor to reflect on cinema. I believe that it may have become clearer along the way that this is a figure which, just like cinema, locates itself in various thresholds. So now I will briefly summarize some of these ideas, which I divided into six, six categories. This is certainly an artificial division, since these categories are, in fact, interdependent in many ways. But uh, well, this is just for the sake of argument. So one, materiality, immateriality. In its precarious and elusive materiality, cinema is located between the material and the immaterial, as well as ghosts who do not have a body in which we can touch, just like we can't touch a film. And still, both the ghost and the film contain some material attribute that makes them intelligible. 
When, and when I say film, here is not the material film, it's the film on the screen. Because the material film, you can touch it, but it, that's not cinema. Cinema happens with light. Two, presence, absence. As a perceptible presence, both ghosts and cinema are paradoxically identified by their actual absence. Three, time, past, present. Usually coming from the past and being figments of memories, both film images and ghosts are traces of the past, which, however, are made visible in the present, the moment in which they are seen. Four, life, death. Both cinema and ghosts are not really alive, but at the same time they have a kind of actuality, since they communicate with the living beings who see and feel them and who are transformed by them. Five, animation. Cinema and ghosts have no life, but they are animated, that is, they have motion of their own. Six, visibility, invisibility. In their tenuous materiality, they situate themselves in the threshold between the visible and the invisible. After this brief overview, I will now focus exclusively in one dimension of cinema, the image, in order to investigate how cinema also seems to respond in significant ways to early conceptions of the image, which associated it very closely to the concept of ghosts. Uh, Daniel, como é que eu mudo para o Luz Lumière? This is La Sortie de l'Usine Lumière à Lyon. It was the the first um, the first f film in the first program uh, of um, films by the Lumière brothers in 1895. Um, as Derrida and Morin suggest, this is fundamentally an ontological problem. That is, when we talk about cinema and spectrality, we are talking about cinema's own nature. This means that, while I started this presentation showing you a film by Méliès, The House of the Devil, I could have done it by showing you a film by the Lumière brothers, since cinema's spectral ontology is necessarily shared by these different film traditions. Usually, we associate Méliès to the fantastic and to fiction, and the Lumière to realism and documentary. However, this division is not as operative as it may seem on a first glimpse. There, there is a degree of porosity between these two traditions, and this was noted early on in 1896 in a famous text written by Maxim Gorky, where the Russian author recounts his impressions on a short program of films by the Lumière brothers. After initiating his piece stating that he had been, in his words, the kingdom of shadows while watching the films, he questioned the reality effect, to recall Barth's study on literary realism, of the cinematograph. Of the cine cinematograph. He writes, um, it is not life, but the shadow of life. It is not movement, but a shadow of movement. While remaining extremely close to life in iconic or mimetic terms, cinema reveals itself at the end as the opposite of that same life, a kingdom of shadows. 
The spectators then would be analogous to Plato's prisoners who are condemned to see a play of shadows on the wall of the cave while being unable to access true reality out there. Gorky's first ideas on cinema are precisely platonic insofar as he denies these shadows, or in other words, the cinematographic image, the status of reality. According to him, these images are a pale imitation of reality, a mere ghost of reality. The analogy between cinema and the allegory of the cave, in light of Plato's thoughts on the image in the Republic and of my previous considerations on the materiality of cinema, projection, and its effects on spectators, allows me to clarify that when we talk about specters in cinema, we are mainly talking of the spectrality of the image. In fact, the notions of image and ghost meet in the Greek etymological roots. As philosopher Gerard Simon tells us, the most common word to designate an image for the ancient Greek is eidolon, which comes from eidon, to see. As eidolon is what we see, an eidolon is what we see as if it were the thing itself, while in fact it is no more than the thing's double. Collecting occurrences of this word in Greek culture, Simon indicates the shadows of the dead in, in Hades, the phantasmatic double of Helen that Hera summons in Euripides' tragedy, the portraits or the effigies that put before the eyes the absent ones, or in any case, what appears in a mirror, but in reality is not there. In sum, within ancient Greek culture, the Eidolon is associated with illusion and it is opposed to eidos, the beautiful and true form that, in Plato, becomes the idea. Still according to Simon, Epicurus uses the plural form eidola to designate the small atoms emanated from the surfaces of objects which travel until they touch our eyes, making it possible for us to see them. Simon calls them a kind of pilgrim doubles that remain invisible during their travel and that are at the origin of the mental image or fantasia that allows us to validate or invalidate what we see. The mental image or fantasy, fantasia, is also at the center of some film theory, especially within psychoanalytic approaches. As we saw, Derrida establishes a connection between cinema and psychoanalysis in his interview, repeating some ideas he had proposed in a previous film, Ghost Dance, directed by Ken McMullen in 1983, where Derrida appears on screen in conversation with late actress Pascal Augier. She asks him, do you believe in ghosts? To which he answers, cinema is the art of ghosts, a battle of phantoms. It's the art of allowing ghosts to come back. And then he elaborates. All this, it seems to me, has to do with an exchange between the art of the cinema in its most original unedited form and something related to psychoanalysis. I think that cinema plus psychoanalysis equals the science of ghosts. In fact, within psychoanalytic tradition, the concepts of fantasy and ghost, or phantom, converge, as Laplanche and Pontalis indicate in The Language of Psychoanalysis. In this important book, both terms are addressed in the same entry and described as follows. The use of the terms phantasm and phantasmatic cannot fail to evoke the distinction between imagination and reality, perception. Belonging to the realm of imagination, and let's not forget this word's connection to the Latin imago, image, the phantom provokes a disruption in the constitution of reality in the way that integrates the order of reality from the moment it starts inhabiting human beings through their phantasmatic life, as Freud put it. According to Laplanche, this is why Freud refused to consider the ghost as something that does not possess its own reality, that is, as some kind of fantasy that does not have an active or, and transforming participation in physical or material reality. In sum, and just like Morin said in relation to cinema, according to Freud, ghosts inhabit us, and as a consequence of this, they are real, and they actually inhabit the world, a world which is then made both of ghosts and non-ghosts all mixed into a deeply uncanny reality. 
And I leave it to you to reflect upon the fact that I just described the real words, uh, the, the real world's uncanny reality in terms that could also be used to describe uh, cinema's uncanny reality. That's the whole point of this uh, uh, talk. Returning to the semantic field of the image in the Greek context, we also find the term eikon, which sometimes is confused with eidolon, but in fact is quite different from it. Eikon contains the quality of double, the idea of a resemblance. Actually, we can say that eikon is almost the positive version of imitation to which Plato opposes the negative phantasma, a noun that derives from phainestai, which means to shine, to reveal, to seem. That comes from phantasestai, to appear, which brings us closer to the notion of simulacrum. At the end of the 19th century, being subject to what Laura Mulvey described as the technological uncanny, Gorky clear, con clearly considers the cinematographic images as something akin to the notions of eidolon or phantasma, since he negates their self-standing reality and sees them as misleading and even potentially dangerous. However, we can also relate these moving images to the more neutral concept of Akon, a mere reproduction that is true to life and create another world, the world of the image, which is certainly iconic and indexical, as Mulvey famously explored in her book, Death 24 Times a Second, but also symbolic, a true new world. I'm sorry, I have to... Uh... What I mean is that reflecting on cinema as a spectral medium could lead us to adopt a platonic perspective and see it as something from the realm of the unreal or the false. But what we should do is not deny cinema its constructive power and its reality, as Plato would probably do, but instead try to understand what is the power and what is the reality of cinema. Psychoanalytical theories contributed immensely to this discussion, but also, crucially, the so-called revelationist tradition of theorists such as Jean Epstein, Ziga Vertov, Bela Balaz, Siegfried Krakauer, among others, who strived to conceptualize cinema as even more than the mere reproduction of physical reality, reality as a medium that not only reveals reality, but also produces something entirely new and potentially transforming. And I guess that Margarita Mdeir will probably address some of these topics in her afternoon talk. Uh, I think she will talk about animism, photogeny, etc. Some very important topics when we think about uh, spectrality within film studies that are, I had to leave out of my talk because it's not my, my framework here. But uh, I think uh, Margarita Mdeir uh, uh, conference in the afternoon, uh, talk in the afternoon will will be will complement uh, uh, my my talk. Um, I hope so. I think she's listening. Margarida, do that for me. Uh, and this way, cinema is not a diminished reality, not a mere ghost in the sense of shadow of a shadow and eidolon, but a specter that not only reflects life but also produces new life. In the articulation with the vast semantic field of our contemporary concept of image, which, as we just saw, contains in itself the notion of ghosts since ancient times, a set of interesting questions emerge. And as we could see here today, they allow us to consider the inherent spectrality of cinema. To sum, to sum up the brief synthesis I presented here, we can say that the concept of ghost conveys disparate notions such as vision, illusion, double, unreality, immateriality, or within psychoanalysis, fantasy, the unconscious, but also projection or desire, among many others that probably will pop out uh, during the day and uh, tomorrow. On a first look, some of these notions don't seem connected to the idea of the ghost, but in fact they are, which means that it is very difficult, almost impossible, I would say, to reflect on cinema in terms that are not in one way or another connected to the spectral. When we deal with films and cinema as a medium, 
we are always dealing with ghosts, whether aware of it or not. With this idea in mind, and to conclude trying to open up the discussion to other complementary approaches, cinema may be not that different from other uh, technological media, after all. Even if it has its own quirks, some of which were addressed here today. In fact, when we look into the seminal 2013 book, The Spectralities Reader, we observe that the editors, Esther Peren and Maria Pilar del Blanco, used the very interesting formulation, I quote, the ghost in the machine spectral media to designate the introductory text of the section of the book dedicated to media. Modernity is indeed a fertile ground for the emergence of spectral media. Think of some forms of writing, the typewriter, emails, text messages, or the phonograph, the telephone, television, radio, internet, chats, uh, video conference meetings, uh, video installations, etc. These are questions that may, be, that, that may possibly be addressed in other presentations later today and tomorrow. For now, I would like to conclude this presentation by showing you a few minutes from Ghost Dance and especially the conversation about ghosts between Pascal Augier and Jacques Derrida that I mentioned before. This conversation not only summarizes some of the points I tried to make here today, but it also raises new problems that I am sure other participants will explore in their own talks. Daniel, par un fantôme, c'est avoir la mémoire de ce qu'on n'a jamais vécu au présent. Avoir la mémoire de ce qui, au fond, n'a jamais eu la forme de la présence. She met him many times. She asked him about Kafka, Heidegger, Marx and Freud. But when she left, she was never sure who she'd been speaking to. She was left with an afterimage that seemed to be drawing her own phantoms out of herself. Je voudrais vous demander une chose. Est-ce que vous croyez aux fantômes? Je ne sais pas. C'est une question difficile. Est-ce qu'on demande d'abord à, à un fantôme s'il croit au fantôme? Ici, le fantôme, c'est moi. Euh... Dès lors qu'on me demande de jouer mon propre rôle dans un scénario filmique plus ou moins improvisé, euh, j'ai l'impression de laisser parler un fantôme à ma place. Paradoxalement, au lieu de jouer mon propre rôle, je laisse à mon insu un fantôme me ventriloquer, c'est-à-dire parler à ma place. Et c'est ça qui est peut-être le plus amusant. Le cinéma est un art d'une fantomachie, si vous voulez. Et je crois que le cinéma, quand on ne s'y ennuie pas, c'est ça. C'est un art de laisser revenir les fantômes. Alors c'est ce que, ce que nous faisons ici. Donc, euh, si, euh, si je suis un fantôme, c'est-à-dire si actuellement, croyant parler de ma voix, Précisément parce que je crois parler de ma voix, je la laisse euh, euh, parasiter par la voix de l'autre, pas de n'importe quel autre, mais de mes propres fantômes, si on peut dire. À ce moment-là, il y a, il y a des fantômes, et ce sont eux qui vont vous répondre, qui vous ont peut-être déjà répondu. Tout ça, c'est une. Aujourd'hui, ça doit se traiter, me semble-t-il, dans un, un échange entre. Euh, l'art du cinéma, dans ce qu'il a de plus, de plus inouï, de plus inédit, finalement, et quelque chose de la psychanalyse. Je crois que cinéma plus psychanalyse égale science du fantôme. Vous savez, Freud, toute sa vie, 
à lui faire euh, au problème du fantôme. Voilà, le, le, le téléphone, c'est le fantôme. Je vais Allô Yes 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 Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, there will be a, a small seminar uh, tomorrow afternoon. It's a kind of closed seminar, but you, you may come if you want. At 4, 4 and 15, uh, 15 past 4 p.m. Uh, Salle des Résistants. Mm -hmm. And there will be another seminar on Wednesday, next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Yes, yes. You. Okay, I'll be very glad to meet you. Goodbye. Alors, ça c'était une, une voix fantomatique, c'est quelqu'un que je ne connais pas, euh, qui aurait pu me raconter n'importe quelle histoire, qui venait des États-Unis. Bon se présentant de la part d'un ami, etc., etc., etc. Bon, ce que Kafka dit de, dit de, de la correspondance, euh, des lettres, enfin, de, de la, la relation épistolaire, ça vaut aussi pour la relation téléphonique. Et je crois qu'aujourd'hui, tout le, tout le développement de la technologie des télécommunications, au lieu de euh, restreindre l'espace des fantômes, comme on pourrait le penser. On pourrait penser que la science, aujourd'hui, la technique, bon, euh, laisse derrière eux l'époque des fantômes, qui était l'époque des manoirs, d'une de, certaine technologie de frustes, enfin, d'une certaine époque euh, périmée, alors que je crois, au contraire, que l'avenir est aux fantômes et que la technologie moderne de l'image, de la cinématographie, de la télécommunication est, euh, décuple le pouvoir euh, des fantômes, le retour des fantômes. Euh, c'est au fond pour tenter les fantômes que j'ai accepté de, de figurer dans un film en me disant que peut-être peut on aurait les uns et les autres la chance de laisser venir à nous des fantômes fantômes, fantômes de Marx, fantômes de Freud fantômes de Kafka, fantômes de cet américain vous bon, moi je vous connais depuis ce matin mais déjà vous êtes traversé pour moi par toutes sortes de, de, de figures fantomatiques donc, euh, je ne sais pas si je crois ou si je ne crois pas aux fantômes, mais je dis, euh, vive, euh, vive les fantômes. Et, et vous, est-ce que vous y croyez aux fantômes Oui, certainement. Oui, absolument. Maintenant, absolument. Okay, let's, okay, let's end here, end with, here the, with the adorable, adorable Pascal Lugier, who died, who died a, year a year later, later and, turned and turned into a real into ghost. A real ghost. Um, um, that's all, that's folks. all folks. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. So, so, thank you very thank much, much um, Jose, Jose, for, for uh, laying, laying the ground, the ground for many concepts and, and some, some kind of, of also historical, historical um, uh, point of point view, view in terms of, of cinema, cinema and the, and and the concepts of ghosts and spectrality uh, regarding uh, this, uh, the history of history cinema. cinema. We have, we have um, um, more, or more or less 15, 15 minutes, minutes to, 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 talk. to talk, so, so before, before I, I, I put, put some, some questions, questions myself, myself I, I Want to, want to open, open right, away right away to the, to the audience, audience uh, for, for comments, comments or, or questions, questions that you, that you may, may have, and, and also, also at, at home, home who, is, who, is, who is listening at home, home can, can also put, put questions, questions and, and we, will we will see, see here in the television. television. We have we there from Pedro. From Pedro. Um, um, put, 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 put,
thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, José, for, for your uh, very interesting, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. presentation. Uh, I would uh, just I like just to make like a make comment, comment uh, uh, which, is, which, which might 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 provoke, provoke some some, some, answer, some answer on your, on your part, part, but it's more of a comment. By, By hearing, hearing about, about this, this idea, of, idea of, 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 the, of the this conception of ghost and this concep conception of spectrality, uh, this reminded me of the of a notion that, if I'm correct, it's uh, tertiary retention, tertiary retentions that uh, Bernard Stiegler uh, develops. And but I think it was. Um, a concept introduced by by Derrida, uh, which basically relates to this external uh, externalization of of memory. Uh, yeah, that's that's so. This relation of ghost with memory and how it plays uh, an important part as a material, some sort of materi material, material, immaterial uh, support for 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 memory that kind of helps us. Uh, uh, as a, for a start to communicate to share to 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 share some some sort of uh, personal uh, memory and make it collective yeah that's it thank you I'm not uh, that familiar with that concept tertiary redemption redemption um, but memory of course plays a crucial role in all this uh, uh, debate on spectrality um well, there would be, I think there would be no uh, spectrality without the past, um, because um, uh, the, the the idea of ghost is always linked to to the past, to something that was and is not anymore. Um, so it 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 always relates to um, something that. Um, That may be present, but um, in the in the present, maybe manifest but may manifest itself in the present, but uh, uh, it is from another time. Uh, oh, that's very obvious. Um, but the, the the interesting thing and in thinking about uh, cinema is that, um, and also photography. I talked about that. Um, it is, as Mary Leader put it, a storehouse for our dead. So in that way, what he's saying is that uh, it is a storehouse for our memory, our memories of the world. And that's very interesting. For example, Alain René, in the beginning of his career, was, uh, was uh, working uh, uh, on, on that topic. He was not really especially, especially interested in ghosts as a traditional f figure, but... Uh, all uh, his work in the beginning, Marianne Ba, uh, Toute la mémoire du monde, etc., uh, is about memory. And it, it is about how uh, cinema um, is a storehouse for memory. We can substitute memory for ghosts. It is, uh, in this case, it works both ways. Um, that, that is a very interesting aspect of photography and especially of cinema. Uh, and it's very striking and uncanny because, because memory, well, you can have, um, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, all, uh, all, all, um, I'm sorry, memorias olfativas. Olfatory memories, maybe? Yeah, like uh, uh, memories of smell. Uh, um, etc. But mainly, at least, I don't know, I, I speak for myself, uh, my memories are visual. And uh, in that way, uh, cinema existed in our minds much earlier than uh, 1895. So in a way, um, cinema is a kind of materialization of the, the visual processes of memory. And that is all very spectral. And um, yeah, this is, this, these are just some random thoughts, but uh, I, I agree with you. Even if I don't, I'm not really familiar with that uh, concept. Um, the 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 topic of memory is crucial. And while I was writing this, I, I was thinking, I don't uh, <laughs> mention. I, I think I, I I didn't mention the the word uh, memory, uh, but I, I was aware of it. 
it's it's really important. I would I would do the uh, I would talk about it if my approach would uh, was uh, different. But well, in fact, I I was uh, talking about memory also, as you said, because when we think we 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 um, we talk about spirit photography, for for example, the one of the reasons for the success of spirit photography in the in the nineteenth century was the fact that people would uh, have that memory of uh, uh, themselves in a rectangle, as I said, with someone from their past, even if uh, it was uh, a big hoax. It was not some. It was just a double exposure, but. Uh, and that is also interesting, the fact that it, it's, it's not an, uh, the real ghost of their past because it has to do with the, the way th that we uh, fabricate memories. And sometimes we just need a photograph to believe in memories that, that are not real. Uh, no, I don't know. This is, I, uh, I just wanted to compliment a little bit on João which is the idea that you, uh, you mentioned this uh, in, uh, two or three times in your talk, which is how far should we go in terms of conceptualizing the idea of ghosts? Should we start on the idea of ghosts being on the narrative side or would be an anthology of uh, cinema or even photography or even image? And what, what João is, is, is also saying is that the, this concept of tertiary retention, which is another another name for technique, um, uh, is in a way that all objects uh, have this sort of dialogue of the past. Like I'm holding this microphone and it holds the, the technical gestures that, that throughout the humanity permitted uh, that people uh, uh, arrived at this object. So it's a sort of uh, long ongoing uh, conversation between phantoms that arrive to this object and that the idea would be that we are, uh, since day one, we are always having the relationship with this uh, 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 memory ingrained in, in, in technical stuff. So that would go as far as the open specter of uh, we are always surrounded by objects that have in themselves this idea of ghosts because they are connecting uh, us to the, to the past. Um, but I was, I was, uh, this goes with a lot of, a big specter of, 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 uh, of the idea of ghosts. But I was, I wanted to, to listen to you to see if even from the point of view of the ontology of cinema, would you think that um, digital, uh, uh, digital photography, but also digital cinema, would in a way uh, disrupt this idea of spectrality or not? Because uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's I'm interesting to, to understand what you, what your thoughts about this. Well, thank you. First, the, the things you said about the objects are uh, something that interests me a lot. Um, I, I, two weeks ago, I was with João Pedro Rodrigues, who's here um, presenting a double bill uh, with a, a film by, directed by him, uh, when at João Pedro Rodrigues, and another film by Manuel de Oliveira that you probably uh, have seen, um, Visit or Memories and Confessions, which is very interesting uh, to, uh, to bring to this conversation because it is a, a film uh, Manuel de Oliveira directed on, um, um, on his house, so the film centers on his house, um, in uh, the house uh, where he had been living with his family for 40 years, and he was about to leave it because he had to sell it, he had financial problems, and it's um, a, a very interesting film because most of the film, the film is much more complex than this, but much, most of the film is just uh, travelings uh, around the house and, uh, you know, the camera rests on the objects and the bed and uh, uh, the portraits and, um, uh, I don't know, uh, the sofa, etc., etc. And that's very interesting because what's at stake there in that film particularly, I just, uh, um, <laughs> I watched it very recently so I, I thought about it, is the is just memory in the objects? It's just like it's very interesting when uh, Manuel de Oliveira shows his bed uh, that the bed is uh, you know has the it is uh, 
transform the shape of the bed because mm. it has the you know like just like in the Psycho, way. the um, the uh, Anthony Perkins mother's bed has the shape of the, and that's very interesting because when you see that bed, you see the um, the marks of the people who mm. were sleeping in that bed uh, for decades. That's very interesting. The fact that the um, the world is spectral in itself because uh, uh, because of what you said because the the objects uh, have uh, our imprints on on them for example uh, and they are always transforming you know this micro falls into the ground and it becomes uh, you know uh, if it still works it will have some mark on it. Um, this one has a mark, so that's spectral in itself, in a way. Because memory is there, and the past is there, in a, in a, and that has to do uh, with... Um, and in, in cinema, and in the, uh, not digital cinema, I will come back to that, it's very interesting because it has to do with the indexicality of it, and uh, Laura Mulvey uh, explores that fantastically in uh, um, Death 24 uh, times a second. Um, and uh, because a f film also had that imprint. Uh, and that's really interesting because the, the spectrality effect, the spectral effect is double in that sense. Uh, it happens on the, the film itself and on the projected film at another level. Um, on digital, I have been um, trying to, uh, well, my, um, my research on the spectrality of cinema has um, uh, uh, dealt especially with uh, pre-digital film, because I am very uh, fascinated by this double uh, spectrality that I just alluded to. Um, so I don't really know what to um, answer you, because I haven't think about that. I haven't thought about that. Um, enough um, but i was i was trying to uh, remember um the guy's name there's a a guy who a guy sorry <laughs> a scholar who wrote a book you you sh you 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 know him sir, for, for sure on um the figural and digital uh, i don't remember his name i'm i'm very sorry uh, uh, but that that scholar um, wrote a book on uh, uh, the figural and uh, um, the digital and also spectrality. I will give you the name later. I am very sorry. Um, I don't know. I would say that I, I I I stay away from digital because it's I can't handle it. It's just too spectral for me <laughs> because there's no material. I, I cannot. Um, locate the materiality of it. People who have been researching digital uh, always say that uh, digital has some materiality to it. But I can't really find it. For me, bits are not materiality, even if I know that they are, because uh, it has to, um, e uh, it, uh, it needs some, um, some flash to work within a computer. But it's something that I cannot really um, work with. I am sorry. It's just uh, it's my problem. Uh, even in photography, you know, I I, I photograph a lot, and uh, I I don't like digital. It's uh, so it's it's really a problem of mine. I I cannot think critically on it because I uh, refuse it in my life. I shouldn't do this because I should dissociate the, the academic and the person, but I can't. It's just too strange for me. But I, I, I'm sure that you, Karl, uh, uh, could say something about it, because I know that you have uh, researched uh, a lot on, um, on digital and you work within... Carlos, we, we still have one question and not m much time. We'll talk so, about Sorry later. to interrupt the conversation, but it's Maria that wants... It's with the microphone, uh, Maria. No, 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 no. It's okay. 
They're not really um, two questions, just two comments. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, and I was thinking um, in structural terms in this idea of in cinema and of cinema that you mentioned, you came back several times. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, um, the potential of reflection towards uh, the practice and the medium in itself in the second aspect, I would say the cinematic, as you mentioned, animatic apparatus of film. Um, but I, I, I was wondering, it's, it's uh, difficult to put this in a third level because in a certain way it feeds both levels, the theoretical framework of both levels, but at a certain point of time I felt, as you were moving on, that we are also dealing with another level of ghostly presence, which would be the, the, all the proposition towards image of Plato. I would say not only the, the Plato's um, uh, um, uh, uh, theory uh, of the cavern, uh, um, the caverna, of, of the cave, um, but and you pass through that, you 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 pass through the etymology uh, and the differentiation between idolon and icon. But I think that, uh, despite the specificity of the medium, any time we think about image, we are also dealing, at least in our tradition, we are dealing with this ghost. So, and that's why probably we need to come out with solutions as you did. It's not just a shadow of a shadow, not just a shadow of a shadow. It reveals reality and it came back to other of your references. So it's interesting to me as well, thinking about image, to, to state that there's always another level that has to do with our philosophical tradition and our way of thinking image, despite its, um, uh, um, it's programmatic uh, 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 executions on a positivist level or on towards truly reality level and so on. Even though it, it seems like, and even, that, even with photography, despite its reality propension uh, um, during certain periods of its time, we always need to justify the status of the image and its connection with the real because of that last room, philosophical last room. And another, th another thing that came to me, and I don't have that fresh in memory, but I'm, I'm interested in picking that up, is to, to compare and to think again about the etymology of the Latin words, spectare, spectrum, and all the radical of spect that goes, and sometimes we, we make it equivalent with phantom, ghost, and so on, but it recalls another completely tradition that has to do with looking, has to do with appearance, has to do with memory as well, with mm -hmm. testimony, uh, and has to do with the continuum, which I think it's also very interesting to think about in, in cinematic uh, uh, medium aspects as well. Something that, can, that's why we, and Carlos used the word, in that sense we still talk about spectrum, right? It's something that is continuous, it's always there. So picking up the, your reflections on memory, but that's it, these are just, you know, thinking aloud with you and, ongoing conversations. Thank you very much. Once no, again. thank you. It was, uh, that's very interesting, Maria, because you were uh, looking into my subliminal arguments. <laughs> there was, uh, yes, of course, I, uh, I, I, I had to restrain myself and I, I, I would not dare to offer you a, a reflection, a theoretical reflection, broad reflection on the image as in general as a spectral thing. That's not my field, that's more your field. But, um, but yes, of course, in the second part, when I, I stop uh, talking about film and the, uh, the medium of film, and I start thinking just a little on um, uh, what the image is since ancient Greek, uh, Greece, um, that's my implicit argument, of course, that um, in a way, all image deals with spectrality. And that's very clear when we read uh, Plato's thoughts on, um, on the image, or even, for example, Plato's uh, cave does not deal directly with the image, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about knowledge, but talking about knowledge, he 
uh, creates this allegory that um, convokes shadows on a wall. So we cannot, uh, so the, the materiality of this uh, allegory, let's put it this way, uh, is, deals with images. So that's very interesting. Uh, and that's why you, you know that much better than, than I do. Uh, in the philosophical tradition, we, also, we always return to Plato because he was talking about images, even if, even if when she, he was talking about other things, about knowledge in this, in this uh, case. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. This, is, this was what I presented here was very partial. Um, and... Uh, yeah. We, no, that's we still have a final question uh, from the, uh, here from the panel. So I'm gonna. Ulrich Bear uh, asks, could you say something about the difference between memory and trauma? Not all the past becomes a ghost, it seems, but traumatic memories haunt us. Derrida seems to always connect the ghost not only to death but also to trauma. He seems a medium more connected to trauma than to our life, lived past, not all of which is traumatic? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, the question is better than my answer, for sure. <laughs> I wouldn't expect uh, anything else from, from Ulrich Bayer. Um, you can answer for... Yes, I'm. I'm looking at uh, the at his message in the screen. I am sorry. Um, about the difference between memory and trauma, I don't really know because I I haven't researched a lot on trauma, so it's not really my um, my research on spectrality has dealt more with first the the ontological problem which I discussed here. And then something that I um, didn't do here today, uh, and that is related to what Maria started to um, to comment on, the, the the question of the ghost in cinema. So most of my uh, work within uh, um, spectrality, let's put it this way, um, deals with the 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 interplay between ghosts in cinema and ghosts of cinema so what i usually do is uh, work with narrative that may not be ap 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 apparent and from this um, from this presentation which was much more historical contextual theoretical but uh, in fact what i work with mainly is with narrative and i work with films that deal with ghosts and i uh, uh, work within film analysis to think about how films think about film as a medium through ghost stories that's what i have been uh, doing inevitably i um uh, think about memory and uh, trauma, I reflect on memory and trauma because when ghosts appear in films, they appear uh, uh, linked to that notion of uh, trauma. That's, uh, that happens, for example, I don't know, Vertigo, uh, Hitchcock's Vertigo deals with trauma. But I, I don't have the, the knowledge to discuss trauma, the differences between trauma and uh, memory in, um, in theoretical terms. It's not really uh, something I can do. Um, I am I'm sorry. But uh, there must be some difference for sure. But I, I, I haven't delved much into it. I'm, Thank you, José, for these you. questions and talks. We had more questions, but we really need to end. Um, so we are 15 minutes late. Um, we are going to the next panel at 11.30. And I, I appreciate you, you coming, and I ask for a final applause to José. Thank you. Thank you very much.